We're very delighted to have with us today Dr. Rebecca Bayek. She is a Council on Library and Information Resources Postdoctoral Fellow in Data Curation for African American and African Studies at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And today she's going to discuss her research on the gameplay of the African board song game Songo and on Cade de Vista, portraying African Americans in the 19th century. This will be highlighting the importance of the preservation of these uh, special collections for libraries. So without further ado, I will hand over to Rebecca. Uh, if I could just ask everyone if you haven't already to make sure you're on mute uh, so that we can focus on your presentation. Welcome Rebecca and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Fanella. And I just want to say thank you to Fanella and to everybody who has well behind the you know closed door to make sure that this uh, happens. So I, I'm grateful to be here. So I'm going, I'm trying to take you on a journey to I kind of understand what I'm going to talk about today. So I will start you on the journey where I started with my dissertation work and then how that dissertation work actually informed whatever I'm doing right now at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. So the topic today is literacies and preservation in Songo and Cardi visit of 19th century African Americans. So when I started my uh, dissertation, when I applied at Pennsylvania State University uh, to, for the doctoral program, I was really interested in video games, like games and learning. But one thing, when it came time for me to kind of, you know, focus on now my own work, I started wondering, I was like, what is it that I'm going to work on? And I did remember, uh, I remember a kind of a stories of my childhood, right? Because when you go into your dissertation, dissertation, they always say you want to make sure that you're going to find something that you love, something that you, because you're going to be on that road on yourself, on that journey on yourself, uh, uh, by yourself, and then, you know, on your own. Just you want to make sure you find something you are passionate about. So, and then I remember the images of my childhood. I'll uh, see my grandfather, my father playing a specific game that they call Songo. Now those were the images, but now I'm finding myself in the U.S. How do I make sure that I explain, I even show, right, my committee what it looks like before I even go into the field work? And that's where the work that you people like you, the libraries and all the librarians and preservation are doing is really important because I now had to go into uh, the digital archive, go into the digital world to find what Songo means and what what, what was Songo so that I, can, I will be able to explain it to people who were not coming from that cultural context, who were not coming from that culture where I was coming from. So that's kind of the, the background, and I hope that in this journey where I'm taking you, you're going to see how uh, preservation is really important and it filters into everything that we do and why your work is really important. So uh, when it comes now to Songo, a brief description that you have is that it's a non-digital game, uh, board game that is played normally uh, in Central Africa, but not only in Central Africa, it's actually played uh, across the African continent, and I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, how the game is distributed. So this game is a true, how, a true social metaphor right, of what it is that the people in those specific communities are living, what are the values that are kind of building uh, social interactions, and then how they conceive and they perceive life. So uh, here are kind of basic explanations of what Songo is. So it's a rectangular board, you have 14 holes, you have 70 seats, and you normally you have two players, and then it's, it's played in a clockwise, clockwise direction. So the game is normally two players, but again, because it's a kind of community, so usually driven as well by an audience that's standing around to kind of you know, cheer the players, but also participate in a certain way to the gameplay. So here's the game distribution. This is kind of just, a, I'm not, you may not be able to see, but I think I'm going to show you the next table where you're going to have an idea. But when you see, this is based on my own research. Uh, so far, these are the number of countries where you find the game played, right? Or some kind of version of the game played. And here, here is where we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on Cameroon specifically. So below here, you see a table, and then the table of uh, the game. Oh, hold on here. 
So you see, and then you see here by country, right? So, and you see that here you have different names. So in Benin, for example, they call it Adiboto. So now in Cameroon as well, you, they, they, they have different, depending on the ethnic group, so you have different names, and I'm focusing here for my uh, presentation today. I'm focusing on the Songo, which is the game that's played, the name, and then the game that is played by the ethnic group that is called Ikam and Fang in Cameroon. And I'm going to focus on the Wundo specifically. So you have you see different uh, type of board games that you find across the continent, the African continent, and they actually uh, it's so interesting because when you, when you go into the libraries and you go into the archives that you guys are preserving, you, you, you find names like this is a national game of Africa because there's almost no single country on the continent where you do not find at least a version of the game uh, that is played. So now here I'm going to talk to you about now the study context. So where, how did I, uh, I hope you guys can still see my screen. So. Here's the study, uh, the, the study context. So as I told you before, I'm focusing on Cameroon. And then now in Cameroon, I'm focusing on the city that they call uh, Yaoundé. So what is Yaoundé? I, I, I'm just going to give you, for those who do not know, Cameroon is actually um, a country in West Central Africa, depending on who you're talking to, other people say, okay, so East Africa, or there's a Central Africa. So, but anyway, so it's kind of West Sub-Saharan Africa, and it was formerly, we would say, colonized by France and Britain. And then in 1960, in 1960, they obtained the French uh, territory, part of the country, obtained the independence in 1960. But the English part of the country that was connected to Nigeria uh, voted in 1961 when Nigeria got the independence in the 1st of October of the same year, 1960, to join the, the French-speaking part of the, uh, the country. So Cameroon is now what we call a bilingual country, and then with Canada, they are the only two countries that are kind of bilingual in the world. So the official languages are French and English, and uh, but then again, within the country now, you have multiple languages. So, and of course, multiple ethnic groups. And so now, basically, Cameroon has more than 250 languages, and sometimes the languages are connected to the ethnic group as well, and in counting, so it's not even all. But now, so the game, as I told you before, Songo is specifically uh, called and played by the Beti, the Ekan, and Fang ethnic group. So now, the basic rules. The rules of Songo are multiple, right? So uh, the, I'm just giving you kind of just to give you an idea of what the game and how you can play. So 70 states divided by two, so each player starts with 35 states, and then you have uh, you start the game with five states in each hole or in each cup. And now captures are made in your opponent's uh, hole, and you only can capture if there are uh, one, two, or three seeds in your opponent's hole. And then victory is based like if you have 40 seeds in your hands, then you are the winner. But again, these rules, rules are actually also dependent, right, on the ethnic group. Because when, like in Gabon, for example, when they, the, the game is played in, played in Gabon, I think for you to be a winner, you have to have 39, uh, 39 seats. And this is so important because they do, they want to, uh, the variations and the rules are so unique in such a way that it takes time for you to learn the different rules. But this is kind of just a brief overview for you to have an understanding of uh, what playing this game looks like. So now going to my study, what I decided to do is that I was really interested in uh, there is a growing, a, a, a huge body of work showing that but games are actually uh, learning spaces, that games, uh, uh, despite what people were thinking before, that it's just balance, actually games are spaces where uh, players engage in learning and engage in literacies. So now I was interested in what kind of literacies players of Songo engage in. So for me to get to that understanding, so I use a theoretical framework, so social cultural theory that actually just says that, you know what, learning happens in the social interactions people engage in. And of course, Sugo was a, a nice place to kind of for me to try to decipher or understand that, unravel that. Situated learning, 
means that just learning is situated right in the place where it's happening, learning is situated. And this was really also really important because Songo, uh, based on the fact that it's made by different ethnic group, was really important for me to understand how, what kind of learning happens, right? what kind of literacy, what kind of learning, how do people engage in this form, in this specific context, or more they wonder uh, at the group that I was going to study. And legitimate pay for our participation is just uh, trying to tell that, you know what, people are paying for our participation patient in learning. So people standing on the side when they engage in the audience, engaging the, uh, the, the game, that kind of, that kind of, how do they pass through, what kind of learning uh, occurs there, and what kind of literacy actually happens. And one thing I want to make sure here is that when I talk about uh, literacy, it's not a traditional way of defining literacy, it's where we think only about it being ability to read or write. Here, uh, literacy is a uh, uh, the contemporary meaning, which was defined by the London uh, Group in 1996, where they talk about literacy uh, meaning making sense, right? The multiple ways people act actually making sense or express, expressing themselves. So, which means that, okay, the gestures, the body, body language, the, uh, the postures, all of that are um, uh, literacy practices. All of this is actually literacy. And that's why, even when we think about video games, the language, the new language that people are creating, all of these are literacy practices because you have to be embedded, right? You have to be somebody who understands what's going on for you to be able to interpret, so you to be able to make sense of what is happening. So literacy here is more like a multimodal way of expressing ourselves all the means that we find, we use to communicate or to, or to make sense of our environment or to make, to make sure that people understand what is it that we are trying to say. So with that background now, I'm just going to give you a kind of an overview of the kind of literacies that I found uh, during my, my study. So there's something that we call embodied cognition, right? So embodied cognition is just like you, you use your body to uh, make sense, right, to explain something. So what was happening here is that these uh, players, for example, were counting. And so for them to be able to count, what they were doing is that not only were they counting, with the, they were counting with their hands, and then they would say one and two. So what is happening in their mind, they're expressing it in their body. And so you have to be, uh, to, to understand what's going on, you, they were using their bodies to actually tell us what was happening in their minds. Audience collaboration, initiated collaboration. This is another form of uh, what we call literacy practice because what is happening here is that people are engaged in some form of collaboration and for them to uh, engage in that type, type of collaboration, this is really unique in the sense of, in the case of Sunday because what is happening here is that though it's a strategy board game that's kind of very competitive, within this context, and within the culture where they're finding themselves, where, uh, you know, you have to be your brother keeper, you have to care for what's happening to your brother. So in this uh, circumstance, what was going on here is that one of the players, Gibby, was uh, in difficulties. And so the audience member that you see here on the side say, hey, so he's calling the other player who is more advanced than Gibby at this game to say, hey, I see your guy in danger, right? So. Uh, Please come and help. That's kind of a, a, a coded way to say, okay, when he said, oh, Piero, they are dealing with your man. So just telling him that, oh, a nice way to say, hey, come and help. So that's a coded language. And then now, because of that, so the more experienced player now, which is Piero here, comes in to start uh, giving him a hand. And this is allowed in this uh, specific context. So normally you you may think that oh it's a competitive game, but because of the cultural context where they find themselves and then the values that are kind of embedded in that culture where you need to have your uh, if you see somebody in danger you need to help that person. So it's really normal. So uh, this is another form of literacy that's kind of unique in this context. Something else that was also unique and very interesting was what I call, call the peer initiated collaboration because there, is actually, there was actually no word in the literature to kind of explain why right, to define what was going on here. So this kind of for, uh, this form of collaboration as well is very unique in what says because here uh, you will see the image if you can see it's here that uh, he did not say a word. 
But everybody understood that what? Uh, he was in difficulty playing against Piero now. He was in difficulty. So now this one that I called T, who was more experienced, was standing by, and then he sees him kind of you know, in difficulty, about to lose. He's like, what's going on here? So he comes closer, and then taps him at his shoulder, a way to tell him that, hey, you need to stand up, okay, signal him to say, okay, you know what? This is not good for you. you you're getting beaten here. I'm coming here to help you, right? And then once he starts to the shoulder and his shoulder, then he stands up and leaves his space. And then a team who places him now to continue the game. And this is just a game based on the cultural context, based on the values that are kind of driving the, the country, that are kind of driving this community. That is definitely normal. So uh, the, 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 the way they express themselves just shows you not only how literacy is not just about reading and writing, but also I even want to emphasize also here that even the, the way they read, the ability to read the board, right? Because he did not say a word, but the ability to read the word, the, the, the board to see that, hey, this uh, player is actually uh, being challenged here, and if I do not intervene, what I see here is hey, that it's going to be beaten. Those are kind of the form of literacy that are actually practiced with this player. So, uh, and within this game and around this game. So another way to say that, okay, when you look at people playing board games, it's not just about, yeah, of course there's pleasure in there, but there's a lot of learning happening. And that would lack for me to include mathematics. That would lack for me to include computational thinking time, uh, we will not have enough time to actually talk about all the literacy practices that we are engaged in. But this is just to give you an overview and to understand how uh, uh, not only using that uh, new understanding, right, new uh, definition of literacy actually enable me to read and understand the kind of learning, the kind of literacy practices that people are engaged in why they playing and why they are playing this very historical uh, and unique uh, game in this community, but not only this community, actually a, a community across the African continent. Then, now something else that was also happening was the language learning, and which was really unique. And because, uh, as I told you before, Cameroon is a bilingual country. Yes, official languages, but actually also have different languages, like the multiple languages of uh, the, the country. And then because the players are coming from et multiple ethnic groups, they were able to create a very unique a way of expressing themselves that you have to be uh, uh, embedded in the culture, you have to be someone who is part of the, the community to understand. So this is an example uh, that was really, that stood out to me. So they say, uh, here is one of the players who say, okay, you know what, he's saying, I'm reading in French now, he says, Vade l'avant, Paul Bia. Paul Bia is actually the current president uh, of Cameroon. He has been there for, uh, what, almost three decades now. And then, and then a translation says, keep moving forward, keep moving forward. So in this context, if you do not understand, and he was actually singing because that uh, Vade l'avant, Paul Bia is actually a song that was sung to kind of praise him for his achievement, the good thing that he has done for the country. So now when he is singing this song, actually within the context of the game, he's just not only boasting, telling his opponent that I'm moving forward and there's no way you can beat you, kind of catch up. So he's actually telling him that I'm beating you. So this is the language that they actually are. So the song and then uh, uh, that understanding whole that, you know what, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm victorious here, and then because everybody who has come against the current president to kind of in election has never won, right? So he has been there and winning all the time. So just a nice way to tell, tell him that, hey, you know what, I'm winning and I'm going to beat you here. I'm the best, I'm the best player. So now his opponent is saying something uh, to kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, what, what that, to respond to him, right, to react to his, uh, so he will probably say, Kelly, Kelly, Va seulement devant, mais les pions, je ne te donne que les pourrissons. So he's telling you that move, move. So Kele Kele, what's the language? Kele Kele now is uh, the Owundo language, right? And then he's mixing that language with French. And uh, so they are kind of creating what uh, the literature has called, like what they call um, 
Cameroonism, which is a, a mixture of French and local languages, French, English, and local languages, just to say, and then in this context, what is it telling him? He's just saying, hey, okay, you know what? Uh, do what you, you're going to do, but I'm just giving, I'm going to give you Pourissant, because when he says Pourissant, Pourissant is not really a word, it's kind of a makeup word, right? So it's what is a mixture of Pourri, Pourri, which is a French verb, which means that rotten, right? So something that's kind of rotten, right? And then Pourissant, and song is uh, uh, when you want to conjugate the, uh, what is the third person of the poor in French for every. Uh, Verb does end by I I R, so they call it, that's how the that's the construction. But he's turning it into a kind of a name because he's putting an article before he left for it. So so it's kind of a a a, a, a made up word and made up word. Why? Because he's taking this word from the wonder word the local language that we call it wondo that they, they used to say bolibang. Bolibang is actually rotten food or written uh, not something. So instead of using uh, the word written, so he's mixing that. And so you can see the kind of not only literacy practices, but they are able to create a new language that is unique to this uh, game situation, that is unique to this uh, gaming environment, that is unique to Asongo. So these are the kind of literacy practices that these players are engaging in. And so this leads me to what I would call now the categories and the transition, just to see again how uh, my work at the Citation level led me and informs actually everything that I'm doing currently now at the Schomber Center of uh, uh, at the Schomber Center for Research in Black Culture. So the CADE visit, uh, as you may know, is that there are actually small photographs that were really popular right in the 19th century, actually starting in the 18, uh, mid 1800s, and then they came to US and then mid 1800s until 1905. So what was unique about the card is that they were actually uh, introduced by a French photographer that is called uh, uh, that was called Adolphe Jean Didier, and he patented it. So before him, the kind of card uh, the photograph that was made were actually uh, quite the process was taking longer and it was more expensive in the sense. So the process, but he came and actually what we will say, he democratized photography, right? In a sense. So now just brief history. So before uh CAD visit, as we you know then so the eighteen uh eighteen fifties, we have what they call the Degota Value de Guerre of kind of we're kind of new whole like surface. And then, then we have what they call the Keller type or Talbot type by William Talbot, 1841. And then I just want to make sure that you understand that this is not really a chronological right kind of process. It's just kind of you know they, that you are also thinking that the, um, the dates are kind of extremely close, so you cannot say okay this is the beginning of the beginning. So do not think about it as being really chrono chronological. So then you have the Ambrose types from Ambrose Cutting. And then the tin type, the ferro type, were at the 18th, 15th, 20th, 20th century. So those are kind of the uh, the the kind of photographs that existed prior to uh, the popular uh, uh, the popular card deficit that would are often called like just kind of democratized card deficit in the sense of photography in the sense. So now card deficit and the use. So card deficit are uh, were used. Uh, as calling cards, so much like what we have today as business cards today, right? So you go somewhere and then you, you visit a friend and you visit a family or you go to a, a reception or an event, you put it and you leave it, you give it either to your host or you leave it there at the table, you extend it like that. So they were handy way to share pictures of family, friends, military men, celebrity and royalty. But they were also used by abolitionists for different purposes and that's the example that I, I show there. So calories are also were used for campaign material, and one of the famous one was one of the, uh, Abraham Lincoln and his son while doing his campaign, kind of just showing again here, showing who who has a caring father, you know, uh, who's kind of you know uh, there teaching his friend, his son either how to read or reading a newspaper with his son. So it's always also used for civil uh, war propaganda, 
and they will also use uh, a screening card, like kind of, you know, ex uh, exchange and say, okay, just like you use business cards uh, today. So the theory care perspective that I use, again, just building off again from my uh, uh, dissertation where, where I think about literacy as uh, being not only a board reading and writing, right, in the gaming, uh, the board game environment, in the stronger board game environment, but literacy as uh, being uh, also multiple modes of meaning making, including visual, gestural, expression, and other forms of representation. So the all different ways that we represent, we are trying to represent either our ideas, we are trying to represent uh, uh, things. So those are different ways. This is in, uh, this is all part of literacy. So, and the argument now, on the framework that I'm using, I'm making this argument say that images are not mute, but rather a specific language. Images will be listened to rather than looked at as sound and we read as text to unravel their meaning. So again, this is me building on that previous work to say now I'm bringing it now on images. So what is it I'm saying that, you know what, images needs to be listened to. So when we're going to look at the images now, it's going to be you and I now looking at this image to try to understand what was going on and to see the kind of literacy practices that these people were engaging in while taking these uh, photographs. So building on this theory of uh, perspective now, what am I saying? Here are the things that I'm arguing. I'm saying that I'm, I'm going to analyze the body language and the sky to visit, posture, I'm going to add, uh, analyze dress and gaze of each character in the sky to visit. And we're gonna go to do it by the way together. And something else that I'm also seeing that I understand card visit as being means for of communication for black people at the time, because again, my focus here is on card visit uh, by black people. And something else that I'm arguing also is that I argue that with card visit, black people engage in literacy practices. So one of the arguments that I'm making is that in the 19th century, of course, we know that black people did not have access. Most of them were not able to read and write. And so uh, historically, we told that, you know what, the literacy rate was really low. But I'm calling, I'm arguing against, I'm, I'm kind of going against that argument and say, hey, based on my understanding, this contemporary, you know, uh, understanding of literacy, they, the literacy, actually their literacy rate was not that low. They were engaged in the language, in the literacy that the common world, right, people outside of the world were not able to understand, but they understood what they were uh, saying and what they were uh, talking about. So you have to be, again, just like the song about game, you have to be immersed in that culture for you to be able to understand what was going on. So they were definitely literate. So now we're going to have some time to actually look at the category. And I'm going to, I'm not able to see you, but I want you just to, to start to look at this picture of Colonel John McKee and to let me to just think about what is it that you see, what is happening, how, what do you see, and what do you think that he's trying to communicate, if you were uh, to think about, you know, look at him and then make sense of what the image is telling you. Giving you like kind of maybe one minute or two. I'm guessing that some of you have some ideas now. And I'm going to let you know now what is it that I'm, my own reading, right, of um, what this image or the character actually is telling, right, the audience or the viewer, uh, anybody who's going to look at him, not on during that time, but even century after. All right. So here is what I see. So I'm, well, I'm looking at I'm looking at the posture, right? He's standing, hand on the shoulder. I'm looking at stern look, gazing at the camera to engage with the viewer. To me, this signals confidence, demonstrates agency. 
right? So what he's trying to tell me here is that not only here is a, a, a somebody who has confidence, but also who has risen as a certain stature. And then again, remember that during that time, how were black people portrayed, right? So you had the minstrel show, you had, they were uh, looked at like less than human, right? And then they were all often in this oversized, right? Dressing that like, they were kind of just portrayed as savages and then contrast that with what this uh, uh, colonial geomarchy, all this image is showing. So this is a, a still like a, a complete contrast. So this way, what I'm trying to say is that the dress, the dress as well indicates social class, which demonstrates achievement as well as aspiration. So this is definitely in contrast with whatever the dominant society was presenting as black people not being able to be quote unquote civilized, not being able to, to feed, not being able or even uh, intrinsically able to even think or to be kind of, you know, uh, um, what is that? adjusted or even integrated in the society they were part of. So again, this is definitely in contrast of whatever has been presented there. So general proof, this is another uh, 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 image card kind of visit that uh, very powerful, uh, extremely telling. You may take one or two minutes, but I know for the sake of time as well, so we're going to just uh, move forward. But again, one thing I just want you to think about is that why is she dressed that way, right? Why, why the king, uh, she's having her glasses, like she's looking at somebody who's going somewhere, right? So, and then again, she's trying to communicate something and you want to understand the context where they were coming from. So here's what I'm seeing again, you see the posture, stand, look. And something that I also want us to keep in mind is that none of them, right, were kind of smiling. And during that uh, time, the 19th century, that they were always showing black people in the, the way they were portraying the big smile because a smile, smiling like that, show us stupidity, right? So, and then they can be coming in contrast, right, of that visual narrative at the time that was uh, showing them as being less than. So here again, the court, she's dressed in the, the, the classic dress of the women of the high class society of that at that time, and Cain just marking what authority, confidence. So this again, just kind of signals agency, right? So this is uh, the, the body language, the posture, the gaze, all of these are means of communication that they were, use, they were using to communicate, uh, they, uh, um, to talk about, to tell us, to talk about their abilities, their intellectual abilities, to talk about their, their humanity. So that, that's just in, to contradict whatever message was spread around there about them. Frederick Douglass, so this is, uh, as uh, most of you know, the, the most photographed white uh, black person in the 19th century. Again, look at it here. Same look, a right? stern look, and he's gazing at you, and then the confidence is there, and then he's sitting on the chair, uh, and here is what I see. So sitting on the chair, gazing at the camera, that's engaging with the viewer. So this is not the shy uh, black person, right, who's scared, right, who's scared of who whomsoever is going to look at him, no, on the contrary. And then again, the social statue, not smiling, right, so showing uh, what confidence, uh, ability, and also here, there's no question that he's not different from any other person that you will see from the dominant society at the time that you will see there. So this again, this is how they were, these black people were able to engage right, with the viewer and even up to today they're still engaging uh, with us to tell us in their own way their stories. Laura Stewart, this is one of my uh, beloved ones as well, and, and you just pay attention to her dress, she, like she stands out, right? You can see that she's an issue one, but again, she still has that charisma. So sitting on the chair, gazing at the camera, engaging with the viewers, so just in contrast, right, to uh, everything that has been said and was told about them. And I think, and one of the questions I, I, I'm guessing that may uh, occur to you is that why were they taking these pictures? And the only reason I think, uh, my understanding, is that the argument I'm 
meetings that they were trying to for the time, but also uh, uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis E. Lewis, uh, Lewis uh, actually, she was one of the first sculptor at the time, a women sculptor at the time, a uh, sculptor at the time, and uh, sitting down on the chair again, we you know very elegant, right? So uh, her posture, just looking at, uh, just kind of slightly looking away, but again, this I kind of push it just to kind of you know uh, contrast. The 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 um the the imagery that was passed around about black at the time about them at the time and just contrasting that with the the visual image of black woman of the time. This is somebody who has achieved a lot, and at the time she went through a lot to get to where uh she came. And actually, I think she died immediately based on what uh history uh, tells us. Daniel Alexander uh, Payne, again, uh, uh, the charisma, right, the stern look, and then the glasses, and then how he looks at uh, um, the, the, the camera, right? So uh, this is what's happening with that. So that stern look, camera glasses, just a uh, social care, intellectual achiever, able to read and write, because this is where you're wearing glasses, it means that you're able to read and write, and then in that address code, and this all, again, just writing, so they are using their bodies, they are using um, the, the, the dress code, they are using their posture, so they are using to write their own stories, to tell us who they are, to tell the viewer who is going to engage with them, who they are, and to see them for who they are. So these are the different ways, and that's why I'm making the argument that they were using the image, they were using card visits to talk about, to write their own stories. So they were engaging in literacy practices and they were very careful in the type of dresses, in the, in the, the way they were portraying themselves and how they were looking at the camera, how uh, not uh, showing that they were not shy, showing that they were not scared, showing that they were not stupid. None of them uh, were smiling, right? So just to come to contact that, we are not stupid as you uh, tend to portray us. Here's someone who does not, nobody knows who she is, she does not have an identification, but again, she took the picture, to took the picture, and then she's found in this photograph, just kind of, you know, telling the same story. She's uh, uh, advanced, uh, kind of advanced in age, as you can see in the picture, but again, just engaging the, uh, the, um, the viewer, not only the viewer at the time, but also us later on. So those are uh, uh, ways black people were definitely engaging in literacy practices. So my argument again going back to that is that uh, uh card visits were actually a space where blacks were engaging in literacy practices. So they reclaimed that space just to make sure that they are able to tell the story so that centuries after them, right? People like me, you and everyone else can now come and read and be curious about why were they telling us what is it that was happening. So you see the humanity, you see uh, um, the abilities, right? You see them as being human, as being, as being people who are able to achieve as much as, you know, anyone else uh, can achieve. So with that, I will add uh, Bishop Goza as well, who is also, again, and the 19th century was really tough, like because of the, the segregation, because of the the, the racism, so what was happening for a black person to uh, be in a clergy position wasn't that easy. So he's sending a message here, right? So he's telling us something. So he's writing through his attire. He's actually uh, writing, uh, telling us his story. So, and then it's up to us now to be able to read what he's telling us. So now you can see just from his attire that this is somebody who has a team, who is able, who has capacities, but also who is able to read and write. So he did not need to write a book to tell us all of that and for us to be able to understand it. So that's why I say that preservation really matters, that the work that you're doing really matters because not only uh, through Songo, as I was telling you that when I came, for me to be able to express to my committee, right, so while I was going to, I needed to go into the scholarly work that libraries like yours and any other uh, library out there, the world, the scientific, a scientific world, work that they were able to preserve so that I can dig into it and make sure that, you know, uh, I can have ways 
to present this work to my uh, my committee. And then again, and also because of that, now I was able to go into the field, express that first to my committee so that they can understand. Now I was able to go into the field and discover that what Sogo Board Game Play is a collection of literacy, right? To understand also that cultural context shapes literacy practices. But also, and then when it comes to card visit, those card visits were kept and have been kept for generation of the Chamber, and I know the, um, the Library of Congress as well has some uh, other card visits as well. So all of it has been kept so that scholars like me and others after me and even others alongside me are able to use them now to uh, make sense, right, to bring, uh, use a different lens to understand, uh, to interpret or to make sense of this card in this specific context. So card as well, then are setting for literacy practices and Blacks engage in literacy for card deficit. So with that, I will want to say thank you so much for being here. And now I'm open to your questions and uh, yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Rebecca, thank you for a wonderful, amazing presentation uh, that was really very thoughtful, very interesting in so many different ways. And I, coming from another country myself originally, I was also smiling at all the different terms and versions uh, we have for the same thing. Um, and it, it's fascinating how just, you know, how different that can be, but then how you describe it. We're going to open up for questions now, and um, if people would like to put those in the chat, or we can unmute you if you raise your hand. Um, while people are getting prepared, I have one strange question for you, Rebecca. So yeah. in terms of the, the game, the type of seeds, I, does that matter at all that they used, or would that, I'm assuming that would vary by country? Did they keep oh. the seeds? <laughs> and, and yeah. The preservationist to me is like, did they preserve the seeds and reuse them? That that's that's a great question. Oh yeah, from a preservation perspective. So uh, the the game uh, the song going Cameroon actually um, the seed it comes from a tree that they call jamsang, and then that tree actually the fruits you can eat them, so uh, use it as a spice. And this is not only uh, a space uh, street in Cameroon, but also uh, there's the other country, Namibia, where they have a version, another board game like that, where they use the fruits of a tree that is around. So, and then in terms of preservation, that's a very interesting question, because what they would do is that they will allow the, 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 the fruits to dry, and then, because uh, 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 they, they dry the foods while it, it's dried. Now, it dries such a way that because when you play, there's a sound. And it has, when they drop the seed in the, in the cups, there's kind of a sound. So when you hear that sound, then you know that now this uh, seed is ready, right? Like this seed is ready for us to use it to play. So that's a really interesting question. And I think that's something that I definitely need to dive into because <laughs> uh what preservation perspective. So yeah, absolutely. And then they kill them for and then the the seed lasts for so long. Extremely long. Yeah, extremely long. Extremely long. I mean, uh they don't change them that often. No. They last for extremely long. I don't know how long, but extremely, extremely because I remember growing up I never saw uh uh anyone because I saw them play I found them playing uh, with those seeds. I never saw anyone changing the seeds. So they last for extremely long. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Questions? Do we have anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question? We do have uh, one question um, yeah. in the chat from Peter Allier, who's our sound engineer. He's asking, do the games ever span multiple days? So how so, long do the games usually last? Oh, I would say, okay, and then that's a great question. So let me just describe it. So um, with Songo, what happens is that you, uh, they have what they call two rounds. So you have to win two rounds for you to be able to beat, like to, to be the winner. 
And then so you can find a player beating others uh, all the time. So uh, let's say we have to, so we play the first time, I win the first game, and then you play the second time, and then I win. So what if I win, then someone else replaces me. So it takes, depends, it takes sometimes days and hours. So they will start, usually culturally, you are not allowed, you have to play only after all the work, you've done all the work. So usually you will not find young people uh, because they want to make sure that, are you done with your assignments? Are you done? So usually people who are kind of of a certain age, will be, you'll find them playing the game. And after the day of work, then they'll start playing. So they will play for hours and hours and hours. Also when they're like, okay, you know what, let me go and relax. Let me go home. So uh, I will not say how many. Uh, I will not talk about how many days the the, the game uh, the gameplay lasts. But I will rather say that how long. Uh, I will uh, I will talk about them. How willing are they? Uh, are they willing to stay? Right? How? Yeah. How are they willing, How long are they willing to stay? Okay, to play a specific game. So sometimes you just get tired. You can be the winner for the entire day. You like, you know what? Today I'm done. I need to go and relax. So that's how it works. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you. I do have one more question, but I just want to hold all the question time. But while other people are, are typing in there, uh, in terms of the card de visite, I was I loved your term listening to the images, uh, which mm -hmm. was very evocative and, and so true in reading the text to unravel the meaning. And I'm curious if from your studies, are you aware from any of them of hidden messages that were placed in the images um, for the black community to communicate? No, I'm not aware of that. And that may be something. <laughs> that, uh, that may be something that I'm not aware of that. One thing that it made me think about, though, is that I often when I looked at this academy, I often think about um, the underground way you hold, right? So you know the hidden language that, that they were having. And uh, the way I understand it and the way I'm like, these people were definitely engaged in literacy practices, right? Because the language, the songs, they have double meaning that if you were not part of that environment and that culture, you would not understand. So how were they able to teach each other that, right? So there, were, there was some kind of schooling that was happening and that we, we need. And that's why I, 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 said, I said to myself that when you think about literacy as being, okay, they were not literate enough. I'm like, no, they were definitely literate, but they were not, be, they were not maybe reading and writing let's say the Bible or whatever newspaper, but they had a language that they were able to communicate and the different parts that they were engaging. So when the kind of hidden images like that, nobody was on the kind of way was like, so like the signs that they were using to, to show that, hey, now you have to move, you have to kind of prepare yourself, your luggage to be able, because the conductor is going to come in and then she's around. So with that, on the kind of way hold, yes, but with the, um, the kind of visit, uh, no, I'm not aware of uh, uh, such hidden uh, uh, images, yeah. Right. I believe um, we have a question from Elliot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rebecca, this was wonderful. I really, really enjoyed it. And it, it, it moves over so many different kinds of issues that are so important. I, so thank you for doing this. Thank I have a question from earlier in the in the um, presentation. And it's really, I don't know if it's a question or more of a sort of um, the way you use the term literacies, mm -hmm. because in this, in the US anyway, in the last decade or so, there's been a real sort of social fight around the notion of literacies, that it has in the, in the very word itself, it's almost like um, it has a value system that often sort of denigrates people who don't have literacies, right, or are literate here but not there. And it's used as a weapon sometimes. Uh, and you're using it in a very positive way. And I'm, I was wondering if, you know, you've come up against this sort of U.S. American kind of uh, thinking about literacies as um, – as a political weapon almost in some ways or a way to put people down or a way to say, oh, we will teach you how to, you know, how to be literate. 
So mm-hmm. I, I don't know if this is taking you in the wrong direction, but I was fascinated about a positively um, interesting way of thinking about literacies that doesn't seem to have political or um, uh, racial or ethnic overtones. Mm-hmm. So. I don't know if you want to speak to that or not, but the whole the whole presentation was wonderful. So I want to thank you for that. Thank, thank you so much, Elio. Thank you for being here and thank you for the question. And I I would say uh, that um, in the field in my field that we call one of the what I call game studies actually the the they came up with this uh, new understanding of literacy because actually they run into this kind of opposition, right? Where, you know, I kind of that racial undertone that you have to be, uh, let's say, uh, educated in the European Western kind of base. If you are not there, then you are not literate enough. So, and that's where the London, the new London group, 1996 or 1992, came up together and said, hey, you know what? We cannot, the people are able to communicate and to do things without, uh, you know, using either the English language or the French language. So how have they been doing that? And so one thing that uh, was really interesting was that there's, I forgot her name now, her name skips my mind now, but she went to Uganda actually, and then she looked at how people were able to uh, uh, do things without being able to read and write in English because it's kind of a colony, a, 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 British, a former British colony. And they came up there like, you know what? People, people are engaging in literacies that they're engaging in some kind of literacy that a language that we do not understand. We definitely need to shift our mindset. Now start thinking about how do people actually uh, express themselves in different ways. And that's why they started coming multi-modal right, representation, multi-modal expressions. And, and this has actually since, the 19, since 1996 now in the field of linguistics, that's kind of a big uh, move now where they, call, they talk about paralinguism where they think of uh, gestures, they think of position, and not, not also in the field of uh, video games, because when it came to video games, one thing that they realized is that young people are playing video games a lot. They spend hours, they spend money, right? But again, they're not paying attention in class. Why is it that they can be so attentive in class, uh, not attentive, uh, so attentive in uh, playing video games and not being able to focus even for 45 minutes in class. What's going on, what's happening, what are they doing in there? And so we have uh, uh, this pioneer who was actually, he's a um, literacy guy. So he came from the curriculum and instruction, uh, Paul, uh, James Paul G, who's there, okay. Playing with his son, he started realizing that his son, son was teaching him something that a language, that he was engaging in that he did not understand. So that's how he started thinking about you know, when you think about video games, they are not just things. People are engaging in literacy practice, uh, practices again. And uh, so, and then coming back to uh, the other thing that's for example here in the U.S., there's actually a big move now where they talk about African-American literacies because they have a unique language, a unique way of expressing themselves. So, so they are scholars actually now pushing against that. So uh, uh, the benefit I would say that I have is that I'm kind of just building up the work that has been done before, and then just kind of understanding it now and bridging of that to kind of keep pushing that uh, positive way of uh, looking at literacy, it's not just being uh, uh, about being able to read or, or write. I don't know if I answered your question. So, thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you. Thank you. We have three more questions here. I'll uh, we'll start with Victoria, then Rachel, then Hadley. Victoria mm-hmm. Bunting uh, says, a very, really interesting and thoughtful analysis. I especially enjoyed your analysis of the Songo game playing, having played a similar game in Ghana. In mm-hmm. reference to the CDVs, have you ever looked at the so-called Zeli, Z-E-A-L-Y, daguerreotypes from the Peabody Museum? No, I have not. I have not uh, looked at it, but uh, thank you for your question. I think that's... Uh, that that can definitely be something to uh, to explore, right? So, but I have not. I must say, no, I have not looked at it. And when you talk about uh, uh, Ghana, actually, I know um, in Ghana, I think the game among the Ashanti is called Owari. So, yeah, very popular as well. But one thing, no, I have not looked at that. No, not yet. 
Great. And Rachel ben uh, Benjamin, I would like to thank Ms. Bayek for her fascinating talk. My question concerns the card they visit. These are fragile and probably many have not survived. Mm -hmm. I'm a conservator, so focus a lot on conservation issues. I'm wondering how many people at the time in the second half of the 19th century could afford such photos and where they were produced throughout the US or more in the north and were they sent to other places in the world? That's a quick question. Excellent question. So uh, when it comes to uh, afford how many people were able to um, afford them, of course, based on uh, you know the co uh, cost of living in town, before um, cards of visit were cheaper, right? Than the card, the, the photographs that were produced before them, like like the daguerreotypes and all of those. So they uh, they're a little bit cheaper. But again, just like the time that we're living right now, so right, so you have some people who can afford some things. So for Bezos. Just a business, right? Something will be cheap for him. For you and I, it will be like, no, that's right. So, so not many people were able, of course, to afford those, right? So, uh, but compared to what was produced before, it was a little bit uh, cheaper. So that's one thing I would say. So now when it comes to uh, the preservation issues, so this card of visit, based on, my, based on my research right now, why I know that card of visit, as uh, I showed you in the slide, um, there's this uh the they were introduced pattern by this French, and then from France they moved to England, and then from England they came to the u s so you have card of visit not only in the u s or in the north or the south uh part of the u s but you also have card of visit in France you have card of visit in the u k you have card of visit in some of the former colonies of uh uh Britain. So you find card visit actually in South Africa, right? You saw a couple of card visits in South Africa. So it's not just something that's actually unique to um, the the U.S. or unique to the northern part, the southern part of the U.S., but it's actually uh, kind of a global phenomenon. And then you have to understand that at that time, this were uh, empires, right? The British Empire, the, the the French Empire. So I would not be even be surprised that you will find some things as well in uh, Australia because, you know, this like kind of former, uh, uh, they were part of the, the British Empire. You have some in Canada as well. So you find them almost because it became a kind of a global phenomenon in a sense. So that's how uh, you find them. So when it comes to uh, preservation, how many of them have survived, and that's definitely a challenge, right? So because, uh, and that's why I think your work, the work that the, the, the preservation folks are doing is really important. How do you make sure that this kind of preserve? I know, for example, at the shoulder, they are not that open to the public as, uh, so you have to kind of, you know, uh, book an appointment, and then they are put in a specific box, and then they are, the, the box has a kind of a, a kind of a little plastic just to make sure, and then when you're touching them, you want to make sure that you don't touch them that often so that you do not, you know, erase or damage why the, the card is itself. So preservation is extremely important, and so one thing that the shopper has been doing as well lately is just kind of digitize some of the card if it is so that at least people can access them uh, online just to make sure that, you know, they are not touched by the public that often. So, uh, yeah. And I, 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 I'm thinking just that maybe 10, 10 20 years from now, uh, you know, with climate change, those are things that uh, as uh, people who are working preservation need to consider because with climate change, how is it going to affect, right, the room temperature, how is it going to affect all of that sort of thing. Uh, those are questions that I know people already in the, the world of preservation are already thinking about with uh, the change in the, the climate. Thank you. And well, I will come back to another question from Rebecca, but one from Hedley Johnson. Uh, she notes, the CDV reminds me a bit of symbolism of various objects in still life paintings. Did you come across any examples of that concept? The CDV of Frederick Douglass with the lion carved chair also made me think the same thing. Mm, I Okay, so let let me put, put it this way: like when uh, um, Frederick Douglass, when he came to his uh, photo, uh, photographs or card visit about him, I mean, 
for me to be able to distinguish between uh, the, the cardiff view and the other photographs of that you uh the cardiff view were actually two and a half uh, two point five times four inches kind of a little bit smaller so that way because he was the most photographed black person at the time so that was the way i was able to kind of uh distinguish between uh photographs and cardiff view. of course the work that the somber uh photographs and print are done made it a little bit easier for me to find what was the category kind of and then but coming across that uh concept i would say that uh no because one thing that when i started my research when i started my fellowship was really uh looking at those uh categories and trying to understand what they were and how they were talking to me in that regard so that's that's where I'm coming from. But uh, I really like the question because this actually challenges me, right? To kind of start thinking a little bit broadly, right? So uh, a little bit broadly about the work and what can be and could be the next step with this, uh, my interest in this category. Yeah. Great. And uh, Rachel Benjamin has asked uh, if you know. Charmaine Nelson, who's a research chair at the New Centre for Research for Black Studies in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, she's been at McGill University. No, I don't know. Someone, maybe Rachel, and you can. Uh, we can. Absolutely. I, I would, I would definitely say that Rachel, please, uh, send, uh, email me and uh, give me her contact. Absolutely, I would love to be in touch with her. Absolutely, yeah. Great. Uh, we also pondering, you know, there's probably a lot of these CDVs to be discovered in private hands or in archives. Uh, would that be your experience? Yeah, yeah, I would say, um, I, I don't know if I would say that, that that would be my experience because when it comes to uh, um, what the, the, the chamber has, for example, right, so I decided actually to start with the, the the African American, like the the, the the Cardiff is over here in the U.S. So I was like, okay, and then we have another bunch of the uh, kind of what they call the international folks, the international Cardiff is that kind of from uh, black people from around the world. So yes, I would say yes and no. <laughs> if that answers the question, like it's kind of it's kind of in the middle, right? So it's kind of yes and no, a little bit. Yeah, I would say yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to check Q and A, and I'm just checking chat to make sure there's um, uh, Rebecca. I've just uh, if you could email us your uh, pop your email into chat. I just put a note into chat for you, Rachel. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So hold on here. Let me uh, let me see here. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, I'll, I'll get that from Rachel, and I'll pass that on and put you two in contact. Okay. Sure. Wonderful. Well, uh -huh. I just want to. Uh, Thank you again for a truly, really thought-provoking presentation. And what's so interesting for us is to all of the different nuances of preservation. You know, it started years ago from everything being a physical thing. And now we have mm -hmm. the, the the digital component, and then mm -hmm. all of the nuances of the, the social socialization and that that history of preserving the society. So thank you for such an intriguing and wonderful presentation. And we, uh, if anyone would like to be in contact with us, to be in contact with Rebecca directly, please let us know. But again, sincere thank you, and we hope to talk with you again soon. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for all the questions. And uh, keep keep up the good work because you guys make the work of scholars like me a little bit easier, right? So we appreciate. It. I definitely appreciate it. So thank you. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye.